I started work at the classical music station KWMU in St. Louis in 1978, shortly after graduating from Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. Soon after, I began doing arts interviews. One of my first was with Stanley Elkin. Before I met Bill Gass, I heard him read from the tunnel in the early 80s, a River Sticks program at the St. Louis Art Museum. Shortly after, I was invited to serve on the board of River Sticks. Bill was the president. A little later, I joined the literary committee with lunch meetings at Bill's house. Thus began the first time Bill and I dreamed out loud about the writers we should like to bring to St. Louis. The group would vary from meeting to meeting, but would always include Michael Castro, who founded River Sticks in the early 70s, first as a monthly reading at Duff's Restaurant, then as a magazine, then a reading series launched at the Art Museum in 1982. Many wonderful writers came to read for River Sticks during those years. Some of them, such as Susan Sontag and John Barth, were paid for in part by Bill's stipend as an endowed professor. This generosity would also define Bill's later behavior as regards the International Writers' Center. Some months after I left the radio station, I heard about a new literary organization at Washington University. I had lunch with Bill, who was to be the director. On October 1st, 1990, we launched the International Writers' Center in Bush Hall. We worked out of Bill's office and the neighboring one belonging to Red Watson, Bill's colleague in the Department of Philosophy, who joined our board. Our very first reading took place in January 1991 in association with Washington University Libraries and River Sticks. Derek Walcott read from Omeros shortly after his book like the poem was published. A year later, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. In the spring of 1991, the exemplary Holly Hall, head of special collections, asked if there might be something that Bill would like to curate for an inaugural exhibit. Days later, Bill handed me a temple of texts and a photocopy of the Parthenon. He chose a piece of literature for each column in the Parthenon with the final four in the sanctuary works by Rilke. A temple of texts with images we chose for the writers because the first book was published, followed by five more. During this exhibit, Bill received an invitation to become a Getty Scholar in California. In August 1991, less than a year after we started, Bill and his wife Mary drove to Los Angeles. Aside from regular phone meetings and his return for our first board meeting, it was a very important year for Bill. For the Getty gave him an office, a computer, and staff members who taught him how to use it. He finished the tunnel there. It took 26 years to complete. When we established the center, Bill was 66. When other professors were thinking about retirement, he was launching an organization that had no precedent with an associate director whose professional life had been primarily in radio, the admiring support of Chancellor William Danforth, and the pragmatic wisdom of the associate provost at the time, Gerhild Williams, the one responsible for the creation of the International Writers' Center. The most gratifying part of the years that I worked with Bill there were the almost daily seminars where our tastes often converged and where our convictions never diverged. For the IWC, Bill wanted conferences and a newsletter. I wanted to put on a reading series and elevate literature to the status of the rest of the performing arts. In October 1991, we published the monthly St. Louis Literary Calendar, designed by our new staff member, Mira Tana, a recent graduate of Washington University. There was the Writer in Politics in 1992, our first conference. After the panels, the readings, the dinners, the denouement, for the first time in my life, I felt bulletproof. Bill, Mira, and I pulled off the conference, and Bill was in heaven, in his element, with writers engaged and in top form. We inaugurated the International Writer Center Reading Series in October 1993. The first reader was Yusef Komenyaka. He received the Pulitzer Prize the following April. Thus began a pattern of featuring writers just before he or she would garner some important literary award, Lannan, MacArthur, National Book Award, National Book Critics Circle Award. We presented two poets and two writers, two men and two women, usually early in their career, 
reading in the hall down from our offices at West Campus were removed in the summer of 1993. We were the first Washington University department at the old famous Barr Building. We signed a contract to publish The Writer in Politics with Southern Illinois University Press, which also published The Writer in Religion, a conference we put on in 1994. This was notable for Bill reading the work of William Gaddis, one of our six writers, who refused to read or to sign his books, leading Bill to remark that he forced a share market for Gaddisiana. After Miritana left us to work for Peace, there was the addition of Sally Ball, who had recently moved to St. Louis. She was followed by two other graduates of Washington University, Ruthie Epstein, and my last associate, Michelle Comey, who worked on our last books. All of our staff worked with a terrific bunch of interns and volunteers, all significant to our work and to our books. There was longer in the planning the two-book project, The Dual Muse, The Writer's Artist, The Artist is Writer, the conference and exhibit we put on in 1997. For the symposium volume, Michelle and I got to pick all the art. Our final book was Literary St. Louis, a guide, published in 2000, a year before we left. The most exquisite pleasure of the endeavor was driving around to the locations with Bill. The lost, entombed, unremarked upon, unknown, unverified, mislabeled, long gone, gone from one visit to the next, demolished, unrevered, the arcane street names, the view of an old and strafed American city that managed, to my amazement, to produce or attract five great writers, not including the one driving the car. Bill worked on a book written by committee, edited by me, with some of the entries written by college sophomores. We continued working on literary St. Louis projects until 2003, when we read at an exhibit of arts and transit posters, each designed by a different artist. Some of the posters are still inside bus shelters over 15 years later. Another revelation, the Landon Foundation had supported our reading series and had given Bill a Lifetime Achievement Award. Right before Bill and I left, the founder, Patrick Lannon, authorized a matching grant to Washington University Libraries to acquire the papers of William Gaddis, who had died in 1998. When Lannon called Bill to tell him about the award, he said, this is for gas. In spring and summer of 2005 at Clayton Studios, we recorded Bill's reading of The Tunnel, another project funded by Lannon Foundation. What was remarkable about this was Bill's ability to retain his rhythm in a reading that lasted 45 hours. Each of the 45 CDs had the picture of the sphincter, the original image on Bill's tunnel. We were also able to create a separate recording of his hilarious outtakes, all on file in special collections. A few years later, I became a volunteer for the St. Louis Poetry Center. Starting in 2009, I produced the annual benefit. Bill read for each one. Baudelaire, Mona Van Dyne, a Shakespeare sonnet, Yeats, and the last one in 2013, The Bell of Blueberry Hill, Emily Dickinson at the Duck Room. Our last visit with Bill was for his 93rd birthday in July last year. We celebrated his, at his house with Mary and Catherine. Bill had quit elaborate discussions, but when I said that Special Collections was working on acquiring the papers of Joy Williams, he started to speak of how he met her at the artist colony at Yaddo, where she was also a member, the summer of 1968. Another there was the artist Philip Guston. In a group of photos, we see him painting Bill's shirtless chest. There is also a woman in one of the photos who would become Bill's wife. It is incredible now, all that we can see of the life of a genius and of the man I adored. In 1999, Bill published Reading Rilke, which includes the complete edition of his translation of the Duino Elegies. There are other Rilke poems in the volume. Here's number 13 from the second part of Sonnets to Orpheus. Anticipate all farewell, as if they were behind you, like the winter that's just passed. For among winters, there will be one so relentlessly winter that is overwhelmingly it your heart will be ready to last. Remain with Eurydice in the realm of death. Rise there, singing, praising, to realize the harmony in your strings. Here, among pale shades in a fading world, be a ringing glass that shatters as it rings. 
B, but nonetheless know why nothingness is the unending source of your most fervent vibration, so that this one, you may give it your full affirmation. To the store of copious natures used up, cast off, speechless, speechless creatures, an unsayable amount, jubilantly join yourself and cancel the count. Thank you.